The greatest hazard of all, losing oneself, can occur very quietly in the world, as if it were nothing at all. No other loss can occur so quietly. Any other loss, an arm, a leg, five dollars, a wife, etc., is sure to be noticed. So, hi everyone. Uh, the name is Eric Thor, and uh, today I have a special guest with me, and uh, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, uh, some really important questions for all INFJs. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, why INFJs can sometimes experience uh, existential alienation and existential anxiety, and why INFJs can struggle with forming a sense of identity. So, uh, with no further ado, I wanna. Uh, uh, give the word to my guest, uh, Renaud. Um, uh, Renaud, uh, would you introduce yourself real quick? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so I am the author. Well, okay, uh, maybe I should start from the start. You can call me Ren, by the way. That's what people, people usually call me, Renaud or Ren Contini. I'm a, I'm a Frenchman who lives in Ireland who has had a YouTube channel for about three years now, uh, discussing mostly questions about personality and focus on the INFJ for sure. I think that my audience is mostly INFJs, but I also discuss other personality topics, occasionally a philosophical topic as well, because my background is in history of philosophy, history of ideas. And uh, as it happens, I have written a, a book on the INFJ type that came out last week. The Ecstatic Soul, I believe that, you know, I sent you uh, a PDF file, you were able to read through it and I think you have a number of questions. It's been very well received so far. I'm very encouraged by the reception of the book. And, uh, you know, I'm passionate about philosophy, I'm passionate about INFJs, I'm passionate about thinking. <laughs> so that's how the book happens. Yeah, I can really share your passion for philosophy uh, and uh, it's something I've seen with many INFJs. Uh, I personally went the route of studying rhetoric and rhetoric is a bit uh, postmodern philosophy. Uh, so yeah. it called, led me down the rabbit hole of uh, ancient Greek philosophy and uh, all the kinds of theories on language and uh, reality and identity and all those questions that I find I think are very interesting to all INFJs. Now, I wanted to know, can, what, what drove you to write this book, The Ecstatic Soul? What, why did, what's your message for INFJs? What drove me to write this book is uh, different things. I would say that uh, there was an internal reason and, ex and an external reason why I wanted to write this book. So the internal reason was I'd been making videos for about three years, accumulating a lot of knowledge parts of the knowledge that I had been accumulating was um, systematizing the knowledge that I already had by presenting it in videos you just become more and more used to what you're talking about and you become so used to it that you start creating connections between the different pieces of content that you present um, interacting with INFJs also like because obviously having a channel allows you to interact with so many different kinds of INFJs that you learn more and more. And I'm a writer. I've been, I've been writing books for a few years now. And I come to the stage where I was like, I think it'd be cool if I actually wrote a book about the INFJ that distills the essence of all that I've learned. So that's the internal reason. And quick, quickly, the external reason is that I figured that there was, there's no other book like this one. Um, there's lots of books on offer on Amazon, online, about different types, the INTJ, the INFJ, but often they are about the INFJ, broadly speaking, INFJ in relationships, INFJ in this, INFJ in that, yeah. you know, uh, parts of the books would explain what the, the MBTI system is, so it's a little bit more like an introductory kind of approach, whereas this book, as you probably know now, it's not so much an introduction as a, as a deep dive. Yeah. That's true, actually. What, what I've seen with many books on INFJs and on the MTI in general, it's very focused on the stereotypical aspects of being an introvert and uh, uh, finding it hard to go outside and things like that. But what I see with your book that I really like, uh, and I feel that really connects to my personal view on typology as well, is you look at 
the how it feels to be an INFJ. What how does an INFJ see the world? What is it like to live as an INFJ? Like those really important questions because those are the things that yeah I think also really resonate with INFJs. Like why are we here? What is my purpose? Who am I? Then so yeah. In this video, we're going to be focusing on the chapter one of this book, and uh, the chapter sure. one is uh, called Existential Alienation. Uh, yeah, and, uh, I can see it here, and it starts with a quote by our very well-known friend, Thorin Kierkegaard. He, I was going to say he's a fellow uh, Swede, but he's a Dane, so sorry about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but I'm happy I, to discuss chapter one today. I really like that introduction quote, actually. Can you read it real quick? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's very nice. So here it goes. So it's a quote from uh, a book called The Sickness Unto Death. I have it somewhere uh, on my bookshelf. And it goes like this. The quote from Kierkegaard. The greatest hazard of all, losing oneself, can occur very quietly in the world as if it were nothing at all. No other loss can occur so quietly. Any other loss, an arm, a leg, five dollars, a wife, etc., is sure to be noticed." End of quote. Yeah, uh, the reason I really like that quote is because I think a lot of people are kind of stuck in that uh, rat race or work or in uh, social relationships where they feel they kind of lost who they are. They kind of don't realize what is it they want, what is it they're about. They, they kind of just follow the trail of society. What does my boss expect from me? What does my parents want from me? And they've kind of stopped asking that question. They don't know that they've lost themselves, but that still it must really, really... Uh, hurt in a sense to not have that connection to yourself even if you don't realize it it must really uh, be an issue for a lot of people um, I know I've felt that pain many times in uh, uh, work and in customer service and in the past uh, I was going to yeah. ask you uh, personally what is your experience with existential alienation well it's it's a work it's an everyday struggle um I say at some point in the book that the, you know, because I offer a way out of existential annihilation. Now, the, the way out is in chapter two, which will not be discussed, it will not be the focus of our discussion. It's called the recovery of the world. So, in a way, a surpassing of alienation. But what I make very clear in the book, and this reflects my own experience, it's that it's not as if. I offer a method whereby like an INFJ type can be like confronting alienation. And then if they reach chapter two, they're given a method, they're given a method that they can surpass it. And then forever and after they're sorted, they have resolved it. That's what a lot of self-help books might promote for readers who are not interested in going that deep and they are happy with superficial device, superficial conclusions. Uh, so this is not this kind of book. This is not the kind of book that makes empty promises. So I compare the recovery of the world as the exercise of a muscle, which means that alienation is always looming for the INFJ. It's, it's not something that's, that is ever going to go away. In fact, it's, it's a similar, the INTJ is in a similar position, but they resolve it in a different way. So what I would say is alienation is something that I confront regularly. The question is, how long does it last and how am I able to cope with it and resolve it? And am I approaching it? Have I developed coping mechanisms where I can approach it and resolve it in a way that is fruitful? Yeah, I see what you mean. Um... I want to give a quick aside to everyone. Uh, if you are curious about the book, I will provide a link down in the description. Uh, coincidentally, the link uh, in the description is right next to also my subscribe button. So feel free to click that one as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and of course, I will also include a link to Renaud's YouTube channel if you want. It to looks very nice. It's a very nice product. And I, wanted to, I just want to add that Eric himself will be receiving his signed copy very soon. 
I'm very excited for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, in uh, page four, I know you described INFJ as the quintessential metaphysical type, and I found that really interesting. Uh, what do you mean with that? Yeah, so maybe maybe I'll just read the, the, the paragraph. It's a short one anyway. So I say, uh, this is the, in, the, in the introduction, and this is um, part of what I explained to be the, the reason why I'm focusing here on the INFJ. So I say, in addition, I have a theoretical reason for wishing to zero in on the INFJ. The particular theme and angles of this book is metaphysics. I happen to believe that the INFJ is the quintessentially metaphysical type. So when I say that the theme and angle of this book is metaphysics, I should specify to your audience and to my audience that this, this doesn't mean that it's a book, a book of metaphysics, like as if you were reading a book by Hegel or Kant, it's a lot easier. It's more metaphysics in the sense of something that's not the, the philosophical discipline as such from a technical viewpoint, more whatever is beyond the merely physical, the merely what you can observe empirically, something that happens, I call the existential level. And when I say that the INFJ is the quintessentially metaphysical type, I think you could under, understand it in the following way. I think that you can under, understand this in the sense that I think that some of the existential and life challenges that the INFJ confronts, then among these issues, the number of issues that belong to this domain are just more numerous than they are for any other type, with the possible exception of the INTJ. And yeah, I mean, I can, I can explain a bit more if you're curious uh, later. Yeah, uh, I think uh, it's important that you bring in this concept uh, because I think it's impossible to define introverted intuition without having some kind of understanding of metaphysics and the metaphysical con condition. As an INFJ, I've always experienced the inner world of ideas as in many ways more real than uh, reality in many ways, uh, where I found myself uh, lost in uh, uh, theoretical concepts and ideas uh, while I probably should have uh, worked on uh, bills where I should have gone out, where I should have been made more of an effort to connect with people in the real world. Uh, I've spent many years uh, living inside my own head and wondering about life and uh, what I'm meant to do. And so, um, yeah. How do you experience that uh, divide between uh, the metaphysical world and the real world and the conflict in that as an INFJ? How do I experience it myself? Is that your question? Yeah. 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 Um, it's, I think I have evolved as an adult, as a human being. Um, I'm 34, five years your senior. So um, I'm practically an old man by at this stage. No, not quite. I wish to say, I, you know, I was talking to a friend recently and I, we, we had a very depressing realization. We said, I said to him, Mark, do you realize that we can't really pretend we're young anymore? <laughs> which, was, which was sad. But uh, in any case, uh, this is to say that I'm different now than what I was like in my 20s. And what I would say is that um, this conflict between uh, introverted and intuition, the needs of introverted intuition, what you described as uh, needing time by yourself contemplating and in uh, it's a inner contemplation because it's it's not like introverted thinking where it's also introverted thinking is a lot about being in your head but you're active you're rationally trying to link things together whereas introverted intuition is kind of like this inner contemplation and so it's something it's it's definitely a world it's a default world for the INFJ the INFJ feels very secure in it and so do I but what this book argues is that if you do too much of it if you allow yourself to, to rely purely on this contemplative mode, this is a straight route to alienation, which means that uh, you're going to end up being existentially anxious and dissatisfied and in despair, disconnected and falling into an ITI looping a lot. So this is something that also has happened to me and I've seen it ha happen to other INFJs. How I am today is someone who's a bit wiser, I hope. And so someone who knows how to address this issue 
and seek a balance between the contemplative side, which I think is essential, but also getting out of oneself and into the, let's say, the external world, which for the INFJ is done mainly via the FE function. So essentially trying to have at least a few friends that I see regularly. You know, I, I think this would be a very good formula. And when I say a few friends to see regularly, for audiences, I think it might be important just to add IRL friends, not just online friends. Online friends are great, but I think that having people that you can see IRL is also fundamental. You don't need to see them every day, all day long, but it's a way of keeping in touch with the, the external world. Yeah, I can relate to that, uh, you know, uh, sometimes going so deep into uh, my head that I kind of uh, find myself becoming anxious and stuck in a sense. I end up going in circles over the same concepts over and over and kind of reaching no conclusion. I'm never satisfied with answers. Uh, I, I know I spent more than five years before I started making YouTube videos, just thinking about if I should start doing something with, uh, with the eye and uh, with my thoughts and ideas. Um, the way I see it, uh, introverted intuition um, is our engine. It's where we get our energy from in many senses. Uh, however, it's also our comfort zone. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, we have to go out of that comfort zone. And for me, what I found the answer to be has been to apply that, uh, those ideas in the world. Uh, so uh, it was a lot easier for me to uh, go out uh, when it was to go out to share my ideas and uh, to connect with other people based on my interests and ideas uh, than it was to just shut off that part of my mind and just go out. Um, it really helped me because then I got the energy and I could use that energy that I got from introvert intuition towards uh, going out into the world. Absolutely. And for sure, that really definitely helped me uh, also reduce anxiety and uh, alienation uh, in many senses. However, I, think, I, think, I think I just, if you don't mind, I, I'll just comment on this. I think this is ab absolutely true. And let's not forget that anxiety can be a symptom of a high amount of concentrated energy not being regulated. So right. you concentrate it in your introverted intuition and it's all there, but it doesn't actually get um, regulated and it flowing to the other functions. And that, when it's unresolved, it can lead to an imbalance with anx anxiety symptoms as a result. So yeah. it doesn't surprise me at all. And it's also very much my experience. I also saw in uh, your book that uh, you talked a little bit about identitylessness uh, and you connected introvert intuition to the other functions uh, uh, because um, in some ways it was uh, hard for an INFJ or an INTJ to derive a sense of identity from introverted intuition in the sense that an extroverted sensing type uh, or an introverted sensing type might. Would you like to elaborate on that? Sure. So first um, I should discuss um, how a sense of identity can be arrived at. I think to, to get a sense of identity is something that everyone seeks, and to some extent everyone succeeds in having a sense of identity. It's unusual that someone would say, I have no sense of identity. So the question and the challenge is not so much not having any sense of identity. It's more a question of having an unstable sense of identity. In other words, you feel like you are, you know, that your entity is this, this week. And a few months later, you feel like your entity is something else. So this, the identity, there is a relation to a, a kind of identity that exists, but the identity itself seems to change. And I think that um, this is quite connected to introverted intuition in combination with its inevitable counterpart, which is uh, extroverted sensing, SE in an inferior position. So we're uh, inferior extroverted sensors as INFJs. This is significant because it means that of our two main perceiving functions, the introverted intuitive one is extremely developed, whereas the extroverted perceiving one and sensory one is undifferentiated. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of 
relying on Jung's insights here. The more inferior the function, the more it is undifferentiated, the more archaic, the more infantile, and also the more light, the more, the, the, the least, it will be the least conscious of our, of our, of our main stack functions. Not to say that it's always completely unconscious, but it's, it's the one that's the least amenable to being brought to consciousness. And as a result, what I suggest is the reason for this lack of stability in the identity of an INFJ or an INTJ is this. To have a stable identity, you need to be able to, to have a clear concept of being an individual, being a subject. In order to have a concept of being a subject, you need to be able to conceptually separate between the realm of the subject, the subjective, and the realm of objects. Problem is because SE is mostly unconscious, the INFJ or the INTJ don't have direct access to the external world. At least their access is unconscious, which makes it very difficult for them to conceive of the external world as such, and therefore of themselves as subject as such. And so every time that they have to conceive of themselves, of course, they're able to, but they have to make an extra step a rational step, also using the insights of others, but it's not a direct link that they make in their minds. And I think that because they don't make this direct link, their sense of identity, which depends on this concept of themselves as a subject, is going to be unstable. It will change from conversation to conversation, more so even in the case of the INFJ, because due to FT, they're more likely to be influenced by conversations, which by definition are with other people, than INTJs are. Yeah, I had uh, two uh, uh, spin-out questions for this. Uh, first of yeah. all, the thing I wanted to, yeah, how I, how I ended up interpreting this was a little bit, an extorted sensing type can uh, uh, connect and derive their sense of identity in what they do, like on an everyday basis. So um, uh, I go swimming, I was out there with those people, I did that, I did this. Uh, and ISFJ can point to their responsibilities and duties and roles that they have. Oh, I'm a mother, a caregiver, I'm a sportsman, you know, like they, they go to those kind of concepts to find who they are and to comfort the sense of self. Um, an extra intuitive can point at all their projects that they're going to do and all the things that are going to happen next. But an INFJ, when an INFJ has to explain themselves and who they are, a lot of time they have to point towards loose concepts and theories and ideas and things that are unproven, speculative, and a bit more uh, vague because you cannot prove the inner world. You cannot uh, uh, prove the subjective condition uh, through objective experience. No. Um, and um, uh, that's actually my uh, uh, yeah first question. It's just uh, um, how, uh, how do you see that the that issue of uh, having a subjective condition in an objective world and uh, having ideas and theories? Because how can we explain that we are having experiences and ideas and theories if we're not out and doing them? Yeah, well, again, these are issues that I discuss mainly maybe in chapter two and three. Um, so just to, to specify that in the table of contents, just for the for our audience, chapter two is called The World Recovered, and chapter three is called Vision and Vocation. And one of the answers will be in this concept of vocation. Let me, let me first mention that um, obviously INTJs and INFJs are not the only introverts. Um, like you said, SI dominant types, the sense of responsibility, the sense of having a very structured inner world that in a sense replicates that of the outer world and that they're able to relate to subjectively in the same way that extroverted sensors relate objectively to their world means that as we observe in our experience, SI dominant types rarely experience this deep alienation and this difficulty with relating to the external world. In the case of introverted judges, INTPs and INFPs, it's different because the sense of identity can be articulated around either their values or the coherence of their beliefs, so their rationality, because a, a judging function is by definition a, a, a function that reaches judgments and a judgment is reasonably stable. The problem with INFJs and INTJs, and ju not just that their inner world is subjective, but it's, per it's, per it's entirely in the domain of perception. And it's very hard to derive stable conclusions from a pure perception. 
And whereas in the case of the pure perceiving extroverts like ENFP or ENTP, they can at least say, well, this is the world. You can just see it. Yeah, I'm going to create some weird connections, but the weird connections will be about things that you see. In the case of the NI dominant, the problem is I create weird connections about things that you don't even see. So that's a massive challenge. Now, in terms of how to deal with it, how to manage to externalize, realize those insights in the real world, I think it's honestly, very honestly, I think it's more challenging for the NI dominant types than for any other type. This is a claim I make in the book. Um, but I try to suggest a path for the INFJ, indirectly for the INTJ, but the book is really about the INFJ, by saying, exploit the, the, influent, the influential and collaborative potential of the FE function. So rather than trying to impose your, view, your visions on other people, they're not going to buy it because, first of all, they don't like things to be imposed on them. And secondly, they're not even going to understand your vision because you're not going to explain it well. It's going to be vague to you because perception is like that. Engage other people in terms of telling them about your visions. Try to federate them around what they mean and get them involved, which was why I, 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 I called chapter three vision and vocation. I talk about, you know, the way I talk about alienation. I say that having a vision is another existential mode of the INFJ. It's another mode. It's something I call prescience. Prescience is not, it's prescience is better than vision because anyone technically can have a vision. Uh, you know, INTPs can have great, a great vision. Like the Google, Larry Page has a great vision. Elon Musk has a great vision and so on and so forth. And in fact, for all their visionary reputation, INFJs are remarkably bad at trying to explain their vision. But what I explain in the book is that it's more that they have a visionary relationship to the facts of their experience. And I call this prescience, this idea of just knowing something. And if you can turn this prescience into a vocation, something that you try to enlist others to develop an interest in and discover in a way the prescience through others, maybe they can contribute and help you extract them. This is some, this is how your in a world can be redeemed. It's not going to be against other people. It's not going to be imposed on other people. You have to use the motivational and charismatic potential of extroverted feeling to get them interested and involved. Yeah, I, I can understand that mo that uh, way of thinking about it. And I also see what you mean, uh, that anyone can have a vision and uh, um, can uh, formulate ideas about what they want for the future and all those things. The way I see it, anyone can use any cognitive function. Uh, the question really is, uh, how is it experienced and how do people perceive using that function? And uh, what does it mean to them to use that function? And for what purpose do they use it? I wanted to challenge one thing you said a bit earlier and was uh, just about the uh, INFJs and INTJs uh, kind of being uh, the type that can wrestle the most with this kind of existential alienation. Um, mm -hmm. I have seen uh, that uh, uh, ENFPs and ENTPs can struggle a lot with perhaps not existential alienation in the same sense, but existential chaos. Uh, in a sense of uh, uh, having uh, so many different ideas and so many different uh, viewpoints Absolutely. of looking at things that they can't derive, okay, but which one is mine? <laughs> which one is me? Uh, of course, to me, the answer is all of them, but yeah. Okay, uh, it's a very good challenge, Eric, because I have an explanation that I can suggest yeah. for, for the difference. So it's true that I would not call them alienation. I would not, I would not call them alienated. But for when it comes to any dominance, I'd be happy to call them either chaotic or disordered. Um, now, imagine that the function of extroverted perception is a function that gathers information in the outside world, okay? And that the function of introverted perception is a function that processes the information that's been gathered in order to make it available to, to, to the, the functions of judgment, where you can make a rational, you can, you can provide rational conclusions and act potentially upon those conclusions. Well, existen existential alienation, so the predicaments of the anti-dominance, 
is due to the fact that the gathering function, the function that collects information in the outside world, is mostly unconscious. So they feel disconnected from the external world. In the case of any dominance, there's not, the disconnection is not there. They're extremely connected to the external world because the function of extroverted perception is the most conscious. But the, the, the processing function, the function of the processing of information through SI is, an, is the unconscious, which means that they're going to collect a lot of information, objective information in the, in the external world. But because the function of introverted perception is mostly unconscious, it's like it's exactly like the INFG is SC, except that in this case, it's SI. Well, the processing is going to be a massive challenge. And because it's a massive challenge, they, it will, you'll have a lot of chaotic information that they don't really know how to process. And it will make it hard for them to reach certain judgments on the basis of the, all the data that they gather. So in the case of the NI dominance, it's a case of being alienated from the external world. In the case of the NI dominance, it's more a question of not knowing how to process what they collect from the external world. Yeah, I think that's a very fair definition. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's what I suggest. <laughs> yeah, uh, the way I, uh, I wanted to bring it back a little bit to the conflict between the subjective and objective, uh, because in the end of chapter one, you talk a little bit about the schism between uh, Freud and Jung. Um, yeah. Uh, the way I see it, uh, in many ways, uh, um, so you define uh, psychology as uh, kind of the study of the subject or uh, the most mm -hmm. subjective science. And mm -hmm. uh, I think in many ways, uh, this is one of the problems of typology in general, because we are talking about something that is very subjective. It's about people's personal experiences. We're talking about things that cannot be easily measured. Um, yeah. uh, the way I, I see it, and if I, you can say if I understood you correctly there, but uh, you argued a bit that uh, uh, Freud and others by moving psychology towards being more empirically valid and being more objective kind of uh, lost touch with the subject and the uh, subjective condition. Uh, will you say that's correct? Yes, I would say it's correct. I would say that Freud, Freud is very happy to say there is a subject. So it's not that he erases the subject but it's, he denies that the subject has any agency, basically. Mm -hmm. He is the slave of his passions, most notably the fact that he wants to have sex with various members of his family, uh, the fact that he has an id. So all the unconscious drives, very, they're very, if you like, biological. And it's, it's, it's useful to Freud because if it's biological, it means it can, at least in principle, it can be scientifically explored. Right. But, the consequence is denying agency to the subject, so the subject doesn't have freedom. No, true. Yeah, I guess in Jung he does. In Jung, in Jung, the freedom, the subject has freedom, but the price to pay, which is too a great a price for Freud, is adding metaphysical elements to the explanation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, RK, the RD, the AI, you know, things like. Yeah, like I see Jung made a great effort to try to explain our thoughts and feelings and values and the inner archetypes and stories that make out human experience. Uh, but many of those things were ignored and uh, um, by psychology as a study because uh, uh, you cannot prove that these things exist and they only exist for the subject themselves. Uh, if they exist, they are they only exist coincidentally because you can measure in the objective world uh, things that uh, relate to this condition. And that's what I'm seeing also with modern psychology, in a sense that uh, if you take the big five, for example, uh, extroverts only exist by based on their ability to be outgoing and introverts only exist based on their ability to be shy or reserved and not uh, go out. Uh, but uh, extroverts and introverts, they never, they never get their feelings and thoughts and experiences explained, like, why am I this way or why do I do these things? Uh, that's what I feel uh, psychology has really missed. Yeah, I think in a way, uh, I, I wanted to say Freud is one. I mean, first of all, it's clear Freud is one in the sense that he's better known than Jung is. Of course, it's, it's still, I think it's still great 
then despite not winning, Jung is still quite well known. But apart from people who are interested in personality theory, they're inevitably going to experience some Carl Jung. A lot of people still know his name. I think there was a movie that came out maybe 10 years ago about Freud and Jung. And, um, but still, you know, Freud is the one that people know more and he was more empirically oriented. But the irony is that for a lot of psychologists, he was still not scientific enough. So the zeitgeist, you know, for the sciences at the moment, still to this day, is this extreme focus on the empirical, which means the externally observable. Mm. Thoughts are not externally observable. So the, because psychology sees itself as a science, it, it tends to focus on what you talked about. You know, oh, I can, it's possible to, do, to, to define criteria to measure how outgoing someone is or how shy someone is. But the kind of texture of their thoughts and the mechanisms inside, that's not something they want to measure. And you're absolutely right. I think that impoverishment, a descriptive impoverishment, um, and I don't think I think that at some point psychology is going to go back to something more qualitative and Jungian, but it's going to take time. At the moment, the zeitgeist is still this obsession with the empirically verifiable. Yeah, like, it's the same in all sciences. Yeah, it's true, and I can see that psychology is actually in a bit of a crisis at this point because uh, they have been using this objective method of statistical analysis, where you have to ask people, "What would you do in this or that situation?" and mm. from that try to predict human behavior. But they've gotten to the point where really uh, many of those studies cannot be reproduced because human behavior and thoughts and intentions are very hard to predict, and uh, people can do the same thing for two completely opposite reasons um, <laughs> so there is there's a there's a problem there so perhaps uh, uh, some form of uh, uh, new Jungian wave or uh, some kind of Jungian existentialism could be the answer and I wanted to kind of yeah. round off this video uh, mm -hmm. but I wanted you to just uh, share a bit about what you think about that and how you see uh, how you want to uh, change the world and perhaps a little bit about Jungian existentialism sure so before I, uh, thank you for asking this question. I think it's a very interesting question. Just to give a bit of context for the viewers, I make a rather bold claim in this book, or at least to start with, on the back cover, there's this sentence there. I'll read it for you guys, and I'll read it for you, Eric, as well. It says, so the first few paragraphs describe the book and what the book is about, exploring the INFJ, the deepest study of the INFJ, et cetera. And then I say, Finally, The Ecstatic Soul, which is the title of this book, is the manifesto of Jungian existentialism foreshadowing a new movement in personality theory. So it's very ambitious. Now, whether this new movement will happen or not is not just up to me. It's also up to who will read this book, who will find it worthwhile continuing in the footsteps. So at a practical level, Jungian existentialism, at the most concrete practical level, is if you had a book like this, using the same methods for every type. I think that I could potentially write, I don't know if I will, but uh, equivalent books for certain types, certainly not all types, because the level of intimacy you need with the consciousness of a particular type in order to be able to produce a book like this is quite advanced. And I don't have that level of intimacy with many types. Oh. Jungian existentialism is in a sense, a unification of the work of Jung with the insights of existentialist philosophy. So maybe our viewers will be familiar with names like Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, the one who wrote The Stranger, sometimes translated as The Outsider, a novelist. Simone de Beauvoir is well known because she's been very influential on feminism to this day. And then there's some precursors to existentialism like Kierkegaard, we quoted from him before, and Nietzsche and Heidegger. But let's say, Jung, Jung, Jungian existentialism is all about, let's use the insights of Jung into personality, derive from those insights for every type, what existential conditions they imply for the type. So for example, in the case of the INFJ, I call it alienation, haziness, prescience, vocation, and once the existential conditions of every type have been clarified by using methods similar to those of the existentialists, and the language is not that technical, there's not that much jargon, 
then writes in again in existentialist fashion about how the each type can be most authentic to itself authentic to its potential mm -hmm. because authenticity as you know is 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 a core concept in existentialism but the, the point is not to be authentic like a type four enneagram four would be like oh i need to be authentic it's more I want to be authentic to the possibilities offered by being a person of this type. So it's in a way, it, it's, a, it's a movement of liberation of potential for every type. And that's what, in a sense, Jungian existentialism is, you know, the, the possibilities of existence offered by being of a certain Jungian type. Yeah, the goal of, the way I see it, the goal of typology and of uh, Jung's works really is to help uh, drive the uh, new movement towards self-realization uh, because I think most people are kind of done with uh, just uh, being part of the nine to five rat race just uh, working to live <laughs> uh, just uh, um, that uh, just fitting in and just uh, um, being liked or having likes on social media I think people are starting to wonder okay but what is it I want really and what is it my authentic self and who, what is it I'm meant to be oh so, yeah I really just want to thank you so much for uh, uh, being part of this discussion. And uh, everyone, if you want to see a part two, uh, just leave a like and a comment down below. And uh, hopefully we can uh, uh, go even deeper and talk about the NITI loop, uh, uh, extorted feeling for an INFJ, how INFJs can deal with existential anxiety and alienation and all those really important concepts. Yeah, I think that we, I think the conversation we just had there really shows that we have plenty to talk about. Yeah, there's great potential. So let's see if the viewers are on board and then we can, we can proceed further. But I just want to say I massively appreciate your invitation on your channel to give me the chance to talk about the book. It is, and, and uh, it's been a really interesting and challenging and fruitful discussion, Eric.